Would you guys like to pray with me real quick? Gracious God, open the eyes of our hearts by the power of your spirit, that we might see your presence and hear your words to us. In Jesus, the living word. May your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hear the word of the Lord from the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did, and by faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to see to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about the things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Hebrews goes on to list others who acted by faith, such as Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, Moses, and the Israelites, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who, by, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. I want to jump to verse 39 and pick up from there. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance to the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured on the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jimmy. So when both of my daughters were younger, story time became a regular routine for our, our nightly kind of bedtime routine. And I would either, I'd give them a couple options. One is, is that we would read aloud from a book together. Um, and the other option, though, is that I would often just make up a story on the spot. And when I would do that, I would include them as characters in that story. So they were part of the adventure. I remember on one night in particular, um, when I, we were getting ready to do story time, and I, I, I gave them that option. I said, you know, do you want me to read from a book, or do you want me to tell you one of my own stories? And they didn't hesitate. Um, I believe it was Abby who just kind of bursted out, oh, Dad, tell us a story with your mouth. And, and that, by that, she meant, like, tell us, make up your own story. Tell us a story with your mouth. And then she gave me a no-nonsense look, and she said, and Dad, don't forget to put us in it. Don't forget to put us in the story. 
Stories are powerful things. Uh, we, we love stories, especially children love stories. Um, but it's not just children. I think we as adults, we, we love stories as well. Stories, stories have a power to define us, to shape us, um, to give us a sense of, 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 of what the good life is all about. Uh, we have been hardwired for stories. I mean, neuroscience actually shows this, that as human beings, we think in terms of stories, we, we understand the world in terms of stories, and where we fit in the world. So what are the stories uh, that do define us? What are the stories that give shape to our lives? I love the way that Alasdair uh, McIntyre puts this. He's a philosopher, and, and I think this is so profound. He says, before we can answer the question, who am I? And what am I to do? We must first answer the question, what story or stories am I a part of? The truth is that we live and die by the stories that we tell ourselves. Uh, there are so many stories that are clamoring, I think, in our world to try to define us and to shape the way we live. I mean, there are stories in our larger culture that try to tell us what it means to be loved and accepted and what it means to be successful. There are stories that are part of our, our family systems, our family of origins, and, and those stories carry with us well into adulthood, for better and for worse. There are stories in our own heads, um, often a kind of internal dialogue that, that, that tend to define us and color the way that we see God and ourselves and the world. And when these stories are false stories, they can put us in bondage. They can get us stuck uh, they have a way of, 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 of negatively impacting our lives and, and, and the way that we show up in life. In her book, Rising Strong, uh, Brene Brown says that we all have stories that we tell ourselves. And until we get honest about these stories and own them, that they will continue to have power over us. And when we let these false stories have power over us, what happens is it, it prevents us from living into another story, a better story, a truer story, a story that, that leads to life and healing and freedom and joy. Hebrews chapter 11, and Jimmy just read a part of that chapter. I mean, there's a lot more to it. There's a whole middle part, and we're gonna, we're gonna read more of that throughout the summer. Um, but Hebrews 11 gives us that kind of story. It gives us a truer, um, better, bigger story by which we find ourselves, a story that's intended to shape the way we live by telling us who we are and whose we are. Now, this story, Hebrews 11, pointing actually to God's story throughout the Old Testament, um, it's, it's referred to the hall of faith often. I mean, it's just a marvelous chapter. We get story after story and name after name and character after character of these people who were part of the Old Testament who are heroes of the faith. Uh, those who demonstrate for us what it means to, to live by faith, to find themselves in this larger story of God's faithfulness. So today we're beginning a new sermon series that's gonna carry us through the summer and we've titled it God's Story, Our Story because in this larger story of God, we, we do find our own stories caught up. Your story, my story, our story together as a church. So we're gonna hear different stories of, of some of these characters in Hebrews 11 throughout the summer. Um, we're also gonna be hearing stories of God's faith and faithfulness from our own congregation. And uh, I'm excited about that. In fact, if you have a story you wanna share, uh, let me know or, or talk to Karen Barker because we're doing something called the Trinity Story Project and are, are trying to collect some of these stories. But your story and my story and our story are part of a story that is so much bigger. I love the way that Eugene Peterson puts it. He says, the Bible does not present us with a moral code and tell us, live up to this, nor does it set out a system of doctrine and say, think like this and you will live well. The biblical way is to tell a story. And in the telling, to invite, live into this. Live into it. For this is what it looks like to be human in this God-made and God-ruled world. And then I love this last part right here. When we submit our lives to what we read in Scripture, we find that we are not being led to see God in our stories, but our stories in God's. God is the larger context and plot in which our stories find themselves. Isn't that great? 
we're, we're not trying to fit God in our stories, then the story will be way too small. But God wants to take our stories and fit it into his larger story. So how does that happen? That's the question I want to ask this morning as we begin this new series together. How do we find ourselves caught up in this larger story of God? Well, the simple answer is two words. By faith. By faith. That's the key phrase that shows up over and over again in Hebrews 11. You heard some of it from the section that Jimmy read, but if we would take the whole chapter, I was counting, and counting rather quickly, but I counted at least 23 times, 23 times that that phrase, by faith, shows up in Hebrews 11. That those who came before us, by faith, saw that their stories, their lives, were part of this story that was so much greater than themselves. So what does it mean to have faith? I really want to use the sermon this morning as a way of setting the table uh, for the rest of the series. And, and this, this theme of faith is really the primary theme of Hebrews 11. What, what does it mean then for us to be a people of faith? Well, the writer of Hebrews gives us a definition right up front. And, and then he's going to use the rest of the chapter through stories to, to really... Uh, illustrate this, but here's, here's the definition that we're given in Hebrews 11.1, 1. and it's not intended to be comprehensive, but, but think of he, the, the writer of Hebrews as a preacher who's preaching a sermon, and, and this is the way that he wants to talk about faith in order to illustrate how this has been lived out in the lives of God's people. If you can read that, say it with me. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There's two parts to this definition and I want to take both of them and look at them. The first part, faith is being sure of what we hope for. Not sure in the sense of absolute certainty. I think when we hear that word, that's what we think, that absolute certainty, that somehow you can't have any doubt, that real faith is a faith without doubt. One of the things that I'm gonna say often um, is that, and I've said this before, but that faith and doubt are not mutually exclusive. I think faith and doubt can coexist and they, and they can do that in the same heart. I, I think of the man who cried out to Jesus in the gospel, I believe, but help my unbelief, that these two things can go together. In fact, my conviction is that doubt is not the enemy of faith. Uh, what's the enemy of faith in, in the scriptures? Fear. More often than not, uh, we see that God says that fear is most often where we get stopped and calls us to, to choose faith over fear. So, so this kind of, to be sure, actually in the Greek, um, the idea is this notion of an inward confidence, of a kind of assurance. Uh, it, it, it's, about, it's, it's about an inward confidence of trusting what we hope for, the future, of trusting that God is gonna be faithful to do what he's promised. It's an inward confidence that trusts God with the future. Maybe that's the simplest way to say this first part. An inward confidence that trusts God with the future. Here's the second part, then, of this definition. So it's this inward confidence, this assurance that God holds the future in his hands, that we can trust God with the future. The second part is it's, it's about being certain of what we do not see. The Greek word is actually best translated as conviction. It's about conviction. I mean, again, I'm trying to get away from this kind of absolute certainty um, because I think faith is about stepping out in spite of our doubts to trust, right? but it's this idea of a, of a conviction of what we do not see, really what the writer is getting at here is that with faith, we're given a new way of seeing, that we, get, we, we now begin to see our life and see the world through the eyes of faith. So it's about being able to see beyond what's immediately in front of us or what's visible and see the invisible presence of God at work among us. Um, so, so these two definitions, let's put them together, an inward confidence that trusts God with the future and a new way of seeing through the eyes of faith that's able to discern how God is present and at work among us beyond what's naturally visible. 
One of my favorite rock bands is um, U2. Any other U2 fans here today? Yeah. And so they've got a song called Moment of Surrender, and, and, and Bono takes a line that's actually from Martin Luther King Jr. that talks about vision over visibility. And I think that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying, is that often the visibility, the natural visibility in our lives, it's foggy, things maybe are discouraging, we can't see very far down the road. But we're called to, to see with vision of what God intends, vision that have to do with God's promises that, that go beyond the visibility. There's a, a story about Michelangelo, the great artist, uh, who one day was carrying a large rock through the busy streets of Florence. And uh, as he's carrying this rock, the community, the, the, the citizens are just kind of puzzled by him hauling this huge, ugly rock. And one of them came up to him and said, Michelangelo, what are you doing just kind of hauling this rock through the, through the town? And he, and he replied, he says, oh, he says, I, when I look at that, I don't see a rock. I see an angel who's waiting to get out. And it was from that large piece of rock that he would sculpt his masterpiece, the David. And I think that, that faith is like that. It's, it's about not just seeing the rock, but being able to see the potential for what God intends within the rock. And it's that vision, then, that gives us courage to step out and to act on faith. This inward confidence, this new way of seeing that calls us to act in such a way that trusts God and is obedient to his will. Hebrews 11 is going to give us story after story of those who had that inward confidence and who had this new way of seeing, even, even if their circumstances were difficult and they didn't understand exactly how the story was going to unfold, they stepped out and they trusted God and they acted in obedience. I want to just say a couple more things then about faith. So we have that definition that the writer gives us. There's a couple other really important things that I wanna say about faith that I think will be helpful as we continue to engage these different stories of those who were faithful. And, and that's this, two, two things, and these are both and store, uh, sort of statements. But as we, as we think about faith, um, I want us to think about faith as being both a gift and a responsibility. And this is important for me to say because as a pastor, a conversation I have often with people is, is this conversation that when things don't go the way that we hope, or maybe our answers don't get, our, our, our prayers don't get answered in the way that we had hoped, um, when life doesn't unfold the way that we, you know, if we were writing the script, one of the, one of the biggest questions I get from people is, does that mean, Pastor, that I don't have enough faith? I mean, if, if I believed, if I, if, I, if I had more faith, if I believed more, then, then, then would, would this turn out differently? And what I want to say about that is that faith, we need to remember that faith is ultimately a gift, not something that we just kind of muster up on our own. It's not about us trying to believe harder, but what we're going to see in these stories in Hebrews 11 is that the Holy Spirit produces faith in our lives. And why that's so important is I think that it gets the focus off, off us and puts more of the focus on God, that God is at the center of these stories, God's at the center of our stories, and that we can only ultimately respond in faith because of God's faithfulness, amen? I mean, God is faithful, that's the most important thing. And as God is faithful in our lives, he produces faith as a gift, and here's the both and, we have a responsibility then. And I love the word responsibility because I think of it as, as being able to respond. And God then gives us the ability to respond to his faithfulness through faith, which means that we play an active part in it. Yes, it's a gift, and it's grace that energizes us to respond, so you and I both have an active part to play of stepping out and trusting God and being obedient to his will. Here's the second thing then that I wanna say about faith, and it's another both and. And this is where I want to land this morning. Faith is both personal and communal. So it's a gift and it's a responsibility and it's both personal and communal. Faith is personal because God is a personal God. A God who comes to us, a God who draws us into right relationship with him through Christ, calls us to a personal faith, a personal response, a personal trust, a personal obedience, 
We're gonna see all of these stories of these individuals who personally respond to God's work in their lives in Hebrews 11. But it's not just personal. It, it is personal. Here's how I wanna say it. Faith is always personal, but it is never individualistic. Does that make sense? It's always personal, but it's never individualistic. There's always a corporate, communal nature to it. And that's often hard for us in North American culture because we are so individualistic in terms of the way that we think. And, and that's true when it comes to faith. We tend to think about it more as just kind of this vertical relationship between me and God or me and Jesus. It's my faith. And, and when we're gonna look at these stories, and, and I love this about the nature of faith, is that faith, it, it's, always, it's always about a community. It's not just my faith and your faith. It's our faith. It's not just what I believe and what you believe. It's what we believe. There's this sense of God drawing us together and making us his people together. When I was in college, um, every year we would do a men's uh, retreat. And I think that that still happens at, at Northwestern, men's retreats and women's retreats. And Matt Floating, I don't know if anybody remembers Matt Floating. Eric, you remember, he was the chaplain uh, at Northwestern at that time. And so, <laughs> your daughter's pointing to you. I knew your dad all the way back then. I've got stories I could tell, not of faith, but of, no. <laughs> Yeah, I'll save them. Um, Eric, where was I? See, you threw me off. Um, so Matt Floating uh, would, would, would do these retreats, and, and we would, um, the, the theme of the retreat, year after year, we would get T-shirts, would have a Latin phrase on it. And here's the Latin phrase. Si vales, valeo. Si vales, valeo. Any uh, Latin scholars among us today? Here's what it means. If you are strong, I am strong. If you are strong, I am strong. The sense that, that we are stronger together than we could ever be on our own and that, Karen, when your faith is strong, that strengthens my faith. And this sense of this communal nature of faith, what I love about that is that it says that there are times the reality is, is there are times when some of us will find faith hard. And there are times when we may even struggle if we have faith at all. And there's something about this communal aspect that says, not only does our faith strengthen each other, but we have faith for each other. And that's what it means to be a community. Faith is always personal, but it's never individualistic. Jesus says we're called to run this race, fixing our eyes on him, but none of us run alone. This is a race that is always run in community. We need each other. We need each other. Let me end this morning as we get ready to come to the table then with a story about community and a story about God's faithfulness from one of our own members of Trinity. This is Joe Leslie. Joe Leslie is 93 years old. She grew up in Trinity. Her parents were part of the group that, that started Trinity, or at least soon after that, from First Reformed Church. And, and a group split off because they, they wanted to have um, worship that was in English and not just Dutch. They wanted their kids. Joe was telling me this last week, Jimmy and I had a wonderful conversation with her. She was talking about the way her, her parents wanted their kids to be able to read the Bible and hear sermons in English in their own heart language because they wanted them to know the word of God. So Joe grew up in Trinity. Uh, she eventually married Cliff, and uh, they would have children of their own, a son named Larry, and then a daughter named Linda, and then another daughter named Luann. There would be a couple more children to come, but I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Then when Luann, their third daughter, was only three years old, almost four years old, tragedy struck. A parent's worst nightmare. Luann wasn't feeling well, and so they took her to Sioux City to the hospital, and they ran some blood cultures, and they found out that she had acute child leukemia right before her fourth birthday in October. I mean, you can imagine how devastating this was to Joe and Cliff. 
one week later from the diagnosis, as I understand the story, some of you will remember this, Luann died. It went so fast. This plunged Joe and Cliff into deep grief. I mean, it was hard on this congregation. Joe and Cliff found themselves asking some pretty honest questions that maybe you've asked in the midst of your own pain. Where are you, God, in this? Why? Why would you not spare the life of our sweet little girl? To make things more complicated, Joe was pregnant at the time with twins, and she was only three months from giving birth to those twins. So here they are, having to grieve the loss of a, of a, of a child and anticipate adding two more to their family. As Joe told me the story, she talked about, and she, and she wept as she began to talk about this, about how the church came around her and Cliff. That, that there were those of you who were part of this story that, that, that would pray for them when she said they didn't have the strength or the faith to pray themselves, that there were people who prayed for them during that time, that there were people who brought them meals. There were, uh, was a group of women that would show up every week to help clean the house, that there were men who got alongside Cliff who didn't know how to even process his grief and would just sit with him and not even feel like they needed to say anything, but they were just there for him. This congregation loved them in the midst of their heartache, and this congregation loved them through their heartache. And when the twins came, people jumped in to help out, doing everything they could to be the church to them. It was so hard, Joel told me this last week, and I recorded this, by the way, and I'm, we're gonna find a way to share this. It, it, it's so powerful. It was so hard, she said. She says, I'm 93 years old now, and it's still hard. And she said, Brian, you don't ever get over losing a child. You find a way to move beyond it, but you don't ever get over it. There's so much I didn't understand. There's still so much I don't understand. And then she said this, but God is good, and he was faithful through it all. Pastor, she said, I don't know how people make it without faith. And I don't know how they make it without a faith community. My God has been so good to me, even in the pain. And Trinity Church is everything to me. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. And of being certain, convicted of what we cannot see. And since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and let us run the race marked out for us. Let us run the race together with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, so that none of us will grow weary and lose heart. As is so often the case, God would use Joe and Cliff's deepest pain and turn it into some of their best ministry. Again, some of you remember this story. It wasn't long after that that another family in this church, the Cromendikes, their child was, was, was diagnosed with acute leukemia. And there was another child in the community. There were three little ones in this community at the time who were diagnosed with this cancer. And it was then that Joe and Cliff, who had been sustained and buoyed up by this community were able to come alongside the Cromendikes and buoy them up and pray for them in the midst of their own loss. If you are strong, I am strong. I don't know where you're at right now in terms of your own story. I think that one of the most difficult things for all of our stories is that the hardest place to be is when you're in the middle of it. And especially when the middle of it is discouraging and not very hopeful and you find yourself maybe wondering, where is God right now in this part? And how could anything good ever come from this? And if you're there today, I just wanna, I wanna encourage you as we come to this table, let, let God remind you again of his faithfulness. Fix your eyes on Christ. 
even if you can't see him right now, know that he is with you, and not only that, but you've got a community around you. And we walk by faith together. Amen? Together. Oh, gracious God, you never intended any of us to do this alone. Faith was never intended to, to be an individualistic thing. But you've given us community. And we thank you for the cloud of witnesses that even now are cheering us on as we run with perseverance the race before us. For those who are cheering us on as we're in the midst of our own stories. And we ask for faith Jesus, that you would produce faith in us to trust you with the future, even if we have no idea what the future holds, and that you would give us eyes to see you, to trust you with us right now. Oh, Lord, we think about... Um, the gift of this community and the people who are part of this community and as we get ready to come to the table we want to just take a moment to lift up these people we love these people you love that are part of our story and we're part of theirs we lift up Bill Minnick this morning and pray for him as he recovers from surgery Lord we pray for Hayden Valentine for Jamie and Rachel and, and, Rachel and Carson as Hayden's up in Sioux Falls right now that you would be close to them Lord, we pray for Arlene Baumgars as she grieves the loss of Al and thank you for the celebration we had yesterday and just the testimony of his life. We pray for Gerald and Harriet Cruzy that you would be with them as, as Gerald is on hospice now and just be close to them both. Lord, we pray for Darby Dystemars. Father, be, be with her right now. Give her, give her a strength that's beyond herself. We think of those who are part of the care centers and, and, and um, Prairie Ridge, and we think of Dorothy and Jeanette, Jeanette Van Vorst. We think of Doc and Margarita. Oh, Lord, thank you for Joe Leslie. Thank you for her story. We pray for Jane and Rod and Helena. We lift up to you Randy and Marion and Artie. Lord, we pray that you'd be close to Alma and Donna and Paul and Lois and Ben, Paul Van Wetchel. Lord, there are those that we carry on our hearts right now and we just offer them up to you in silence. Lord, continue to strengthen us together as your people that we might be faithful to the call that you've put on our life together. We pray for the other churches in our community and region. We pray for the work that you're doing. And Lord, we lift up to you our nation. We pray for our president. We pray for our other leaders that you would give them wisdom to govern fairly and wisely. And Lord, we think of all nations. We think of every church and every place and how all of our stories are connected to your larger story that this communion of saints, this cloud of witnesses, it stretches beyond the walls of this sanctuary and it stretches far back into history and it's amazing to be a part of such a remarkable story. So as we come to the table now, Lord, we ask that you would be with us, that you would strengthen us, and Lord, that you would give us what we need to be faithful to you as you are the faithful one to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.